Hello and welcome to the Society of Antiquaries of London lecture. Today I'm really pleased to welcome Bruce Boucher who's going to talk to us about Sir John Soane. Bruce was director of the Sir John Soane's Museum from 2016 to 2023 uh, and he is a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries. He's published numerous books on art and architecture and sculpture and he's currently working on a book about Jakob Burkhardt, the 19th century Swiss cultural historian. His latest book is John Soane's Cabinet of Curiosities, Reflections on an Architect and His Collections, which was published by Yale University Press in 2024. Thank you, Bruce, and over to you. Thank you, Anuska. I've called my lecture A Maze Without a Plan, which is a reference to um, Alexander Pope's poem, An Essay on Man, which begins with an invitation to the reader to expatiate free or all this scene of man, a mighty maze, but not without a plan. And it seems an apt way to begin a discussion of display in Sir John Soane's museum. There is no doubt that the subject is fraught. And as with Soane's architecture in general, it is an experience that could never be described as neutral. Ever since the museum first opened its doors, visitors of all kinds have tried to make sense of it, or at least to let it wash over them. And when I first came to the museum as director, I'd known it, of course, but uh, I was struck by the fact that uh, there have traditionally been no labels. Um, the juxtaposition of works, Greek, Roman, medieval, uh, non-Western even, uh, is uh, often uh, baffling uh, and uh, provocative. And I remember um, Mark Bloch, the French historian, once said that it's always useful to explore the history of a word. And I think one can expand this to the history of an institution. So for my own satisfaction, I wanted to try to unpack what was what I could find behind the uh, display in the zone itself. Of course, John Soane said that it was um, everything was arranged as studies for my own mind, but he never divulged what he meant by that. So it, it's as if he withheld the key. And over the years, people have been trying to understand what he meant by this and also try to uh, make sense of the phenomenon uh, of the Zone Museum. And I think one way of um, exploring this is by looking at three different reactions to it by all three of them German uh, in the 19th century. The first is the great architect uh, and contemporary of Soane's, Carl Friedrich Schinkel, who saw Soane's house in London in 1826 and was baffled by it. He wrote in his travel diary, like all private houses in London, this is small, but it contains a great number of casts, fragments of antique statues and buildings, vases, sarcophagi, little panels and bronzes, all exhibited in the riskiest manner, in small spaces lit from above and the side, often spaces only three feet wide. Medieval, antique and modern works are intermingled at every level, in courtyards resembling cemeteries, in chapel-like rooms, in catacombs and drawing rooms ornamented in Herculanean and Gothic styles little deceptions everywhere. Clearly, he wasn't impressed. And Schinkel also felt the same way about Bank of England, which was Soane's greatest uh, architectural achievement, which he toured during his time in London. Perhaps Schinkel was also surprised that a collection which foregrounded architectural casts and fragments did not incorporate a developmental approach to the history of the discipline. And indeed, Soane was professor of the history of architecture at the Royal Academy, and he was certainly well aware of the arc of civilization, although this was not the focus of the display in his house museum. The second observation uh, I want to uh, allude to is by the great German art historian and founder of the Berlin Museums, Gustav Wagen, who published in 18... 38, um, a work on uh, the art and artists in England, which was like a kind of guidebook to uh, public and private collections. This was a year after Soane's death. Sorry, 
the uh, what he says is the rooms are small and such an immense number of uh, works are crowded together in three different stories so that it is the work of some hours to gain even a sufficient superficial view of them. I observe that the whole, notwithstanding the picturesque, fantastic charm, has in consequence of this an arbitrary mixture, this arbitrary mixture of heterogeneous objects, something of the unpleasant effect of a feverish dream. It is, he concluded, a splendid example of English whimsicalness. As the organizer of the Berlin Museums, Wagen would have had little appetite for the jumbled presentation of Soane's museum, which ran counter to the principles of the nascent discipline of art history. Next and finally, uh, in 1882, the German archaeologist Adolf Michaelis was even more damning in his assessment of what he saw. Non multum sed multa, not much but many, appears to have been Soane's motto in collecting, for there is something of everything, along with a few choice specimens of high value or at least of considerable interest, there is an immeasurable chaos of worthless fragments of all types from all countries, of all kinds of art, original and copies mixed together. All this is crammed into the narrow limits of a private house and is arranged in so ingenious a manner that no corner, however dark, is left unoccupied. In this respect, the architect has achieved marvels. Nevertheless, this labyrinth, stuffed full of fragments, is the most tasteless arrangement that can be seen. It has the same kind of perplexing and oppressive effect on the spectator as if the whole large stock of an old clothes dealer had been squeezed into a doll's house. Then again, the impression conveyed by so wild a confusion of promiscuous fragments is necessarily bewildering and fatiguing to the visitor. So all three of these comments fasten on the, what we would call today, information overload that can make visiting the zone an uncomfortable experience. If there's a common theme underpinning them, it is uh, eclecticism, which was and still is an issue, both with Soane's architecture and the display of his own collections. Elements of his display can find points of comparison in other collections of the period, yet there is much about the Soane Museum that is sui generis. And this can be explained because it is a rare survivor of a kind of private collection that was common in the London of his day. Nevertheless, the fascination of the Soane Museum also reflects its place on the cusp of the shift from the Renaissance cabinet of curiosity towards the post-Enlightenment museum. And looking back, uh, one can see the prototypes for the way in which Soane composed a, a situation like the wall, this wall in the dome area, the very heart of the museum. It was both a reference library, visual reference library for himself and uh, his pupils, uh, but also it was the kind of thing that he would have seen in other collections of the day. This is a, a watercolor of the entrance hall of Charles Townley's house on Park Street, um, which was crammed with uh, rare classical uh, marbles uh, and was a tourist attraction uh, long before it ended up in the Mu British Museum in the early 1900s as the Townley collection. Indeed, a special brand, uh, group of uh, galleries was built for the Townley collection in the old British Museum uh, in the first decade of the 19th century. So it wasn't, uh, it was typical of the kind of uh, collections that Soane would have seen, the Thomas Hope's collection, which we know he visited several uh, times and uh, with whom he uh, corresponded, also was um, a, a virtual museum in an era before um, museums really became, took hold on the public conscience. And again, when Soane formulated the idea of leaving his house and collection to the nation, it wasn't as unusual as it may seem now, because of course, in 1824, 
the National Gallery opened in uh, Pall Mall in the house of John Julius Angerstein. And uh, this is a view of uh, the interiors around uh, 1830. And of course, there were complaints about the fact that um, Paris had the Louvre, but uh, London only had a small townhouse, undistinguished townhouse in uh, the West End. So this was not uh, an unusual thing. And of course, bear in mind that after Soane's death, the um, National Gallery moved into its new premises uh, in Trafalgar Square. And of course, in these, in the same years, the late 1830s, 1840s, <clears throat> the British Museum was rebuilt from the old 17th century Montague House into the great neoclassical temple that we know today. And here I'm showing you another view of the house as it appeared in 1825. Soane had a number of watercolors uh, done particularly by his amanuensis, Joseph Michael Gandhi, who was an undistinguished architect, but quite a great um, watercolorist, and uh, really was Soane's uh, hand um, presenting to the public his ideas. And you can see the view of the monk's parlor and looking above the vault with the light shining into the picture room recess. It um, was a type of uh, experience which Soane really conceived as a kind of mood journey. You go and you still go from large open spaces to small spaces. You encounter, as um, Schinkel noted, uh, little spaces um, with um, deceptions that uh, really manipulate uh, the the spectator. It is in in many ways a, a total work of art. And the source of this goes back really to the way in which uh, works of art, particularly uh, classical reliefs, were displayed from the Renaissance onwards. Here one's looking at the uh, garden facade of the Villa Medici, the um, French Academy now, uh, as it would have looked in, in Soane's day. And of course, um, the reliefs and statues on the facade had come from earlier collections, notably the Palazzo della Valle, which had a courtyard with many of these reliefs uh, displayed in the 16th century, where people like uh, Michelangelo uh, saw and uh, copied them. And one can see uh, this in private houses, Palazzo Corsini in Florence also has a wall which has uh, Roman inscriptions embedded in it. And if we look at the drawing office, um, really the earliest surviving architectural uh, studio in uh, the UK, um, which Soane created in um, the early 1820s, um, the plaster casts on the wall uh, were meant to be um, study uh, objects for his pupils who would uh, copy them uh, at various times of, of the day. Um, it didn't matter so much to uh, where they came from. And there is a mixture, there are some that are even medieval, but the idea was to be able to capture the three-dimensional quality in uh, two-dimensional drawings. Soon, like Thomas Sandby, who was his predecessor as a professor of architecture at the Royal Academy, believed that it was much better for students to copy a three-dimensional object rather than a two-dimensional drawing or engraving, because the um, drawing or engraving would essentially flatten out the physical nature of the work itself. You'll also notice in this, which was uh, really the last major part of the museum to be restored, uh, it was restored between 2021 and 2023, um, some of Soane's models, he was very keen on uh, models as touchstones for buildings, and also you can see a um, cork model of an Etruscan tomb on the left, We'll come back, we'll touch on this uh, again later. Um, these were very popular in the 
18th uh, century and by its own day had largely um, waned in, in, in popularity. So Soane, um, as you probably know, originally um, made Pitsanger Manor, which was his country house that he owned between 1800 and 1809, uh, the focus of his uh, experiments with uh, display of this kind and creating a medieval uh, monk's dining room and uh, folly of ruins, classical ruins. Uh, but he and his wife decided uh, in 1809 to focus on Lincoln's Inn Field, where he had his first house, um, which he uh, built in 1792 on the north side. And then in 1808, he negotiated the purchase of number 13, the house next door. Um, you can see on the right-hand screen the um, plan as it is today, and it really composes uh, three buildings. But what I wanted to focus on first was that around 1810, when he was building um, beginning to build uh, number 13, he conceived of a totally different plan, which was to turn the ground floor of 12 and 13 into something like a coherent uh, museum, as we would recognize it, um, with uh, library, um, plaster casts, galleries, uh, gallery for drawings and prints, so on and so forth. Um, an area in which he would, in part, live, there was an eating room, uh, which could double also as a, as a picture display, as at um, Pitzhanger. But uh, presumably, like Thomas Hope, he would live on the floor above, and this would be given over to a museum. However, as it turned out, he did something much more interesting, if uh, complicated, because he decided that he couldn't really afford to um, keep both uh, merge both numbers 12 and 13. So he swapped leases with his uh, tenant in number 13. And he took from number 12 the area, or kept from number 12, uh, the area at the back of the building, which was his architectural office, and added it to number 13. And what one notices when one looks at the plan of uh, the building today, after he bought number 14, to expand his collections in uh, 1822. The old yards of the houses um, on this uh, 17th century square were turned into a series of interconnecting galleries, top lit, uh, much like uh, Dulwich uh, itself. And Another point one might make while we're looking at these um, plans is that in Soane's mind, there was no clear distinction between, there was a distinction between the house and the museum or the academy, as he referred to the area in the back of the house, which was where he kept most of his collections. But gradually over the years, as his collection expanded, this um, was eroded. And here I'm showing you another one of the Gandhi uh, views um, it was uh, displayed like virtually all of Gandhi's major work for Soane at the Royal Academy summer exhibition where it would have been seen by tens of thousands of people. And uh, this was displayed in 1822. It, it merely says it was a townhouse in London, but it would have been fairly clear to most people that this was Soane's townhouse. You can... If you've been there, you can recognize the library dining room, which occupies the center space. The facade, which was much attacked when it was built in 1812, it was considered a, an eyesore. And in fact, Soane got into trouble for projecting it in front of the line of the other houses on the terrace. Um, eventually, he, he was taken to court, but he won the, uh, the case. And so today, we, as we see the uh, Soane Museum, it really calls attention to itself on the north uh, side of the museum. And then you see the plan, which is like an inverted L. And this is before he added number 14 uh, in 1824, which made it more of, of a T shape, as I said. And in the lower right hand corner, one of the most celebrated and imitated of the rooms, the uh, breakfast room. What Soane um, 
liked in terms of collecting was what one of the things that interested him and also reassured him was provenance. He bought from collections <clears throat> which in a sense had already vetted these objects. And I'm showing you a famous example, a double, <clears throat> double cinerarium, which he bought at the sale of uh, the Earl of Bessborough in 1801, along with a number of other marbles. Um, he spent over 200 pounds, 211, if I remember correctly. And this one would have been particularly interesting to him because of uh, the fact that it had belonged to Bartolomeo Cavaceppi, who was one of the first great uh, restorers of Roman uh, sculpture in the middle of the 18th century, and then Piranesi, whom he actually had met. And this particular cinerarium had been the subject of an engraving by Piranesi dedicated to one of his English patrons. So works like this, or indeed the Diana of Ephesus, one of the major classical sculptures, which may have come from the Villa Giulia and certainly was in the collections of Cardinal Rio, Rodolfo Pio da Carpi, and again, the Earl of Bespera. Um, these works would have attested to Soane's position as a man of means, but also a man of uh, discernment, um, a connoisseur much like uh, Robert Adam, who in many ways was uh, his role model here. Going throughout the house, uh, to a large degree, the marbles are intermingled with plaster casts, which was typical of 18th century uh, collections. You can still find it today in places like Newby Hall in uh, Yorkshire. But this view of uh, Roman floral fragments, which was arranged in Soane's little study, um, really part of the house as opposed to what he would call the Academy or Museum, um, was kept together exceptionally. It was put together by Charles Heathcote Tatham, who had been the architect of Thomas Hope's uh, galleries in uh, the, his house in the West End. Uh, he'd collected them in Rome for Henry Holland, for whom Soane worked um, early in his career. Uh, he collected them between 1794 and 1796 and then had to sell them. And Soane acquired them from Holland's heirs, but uh, he put them together very much as they were engraved by Tatham in a book that he published on this collection um, in, I think, about 1812. And it was arranged according to motifs like floral motifs or the anthemion. And you can see here that what Soane often does throughout the building is to take a visual theme and put works together whether or not they belong to the same uh, period or indeed uh, the same uh, culture, to show a kind of kinship across uh, the ancient world. And this is something that he had uh, imbibed from the writings of the um, French theoretician, um, amateur archaeologist, uh, the Baron Duncanville. He knew Donkerville's works. Uh, Donkerville had catalogued the Townley collection of marbles, and he advanced uh, rather daring ideas that suggested that the um, there was one common religion in the ancient world from east to west, and that was why images turned up uh, across cultures from uh, Greece and Rome to India and finally to, uh, to Japan. The apogee of Soane's collecting in this area was really the acquisition in 1824 of the uh, sarcophagus of the Egyptian pharaoh Seti I, which was installed in the crypt in 1825. We're looking here at an illustration of it as it first appeared in uh, the museum uh, from uh, an unusual but very interesting book uh, by John Britton, an antiquarian and uh, something of a kind of lackey of Soane's. He often did uh, Soane's bidding for him at auction and things like that. Um, it was called the Union of uh, Sculpture Architecture uh, 
in um and basically the focus of it was Soane's house in um Lincoln's Inn Field, and it was an early attempt at a guidebook. It wasn't a, a great success, and in fact, it prompted Soane to write his own privately printed descriptions of the house. Um, but what's interesting about this is that Soane is created in the in the crypt, which was under the dome, the very heart of the museum, an area where he wanted the um, a, a great showpiece um and he tried many different things before he found the right one with the uh, sarcophagus he he referred to the area as a crypt because in his mind and in terms of the things that were shown there it was associated with death burial uh funerary uh urns and the like and here he's put together as you can see in the illustration a um, plaster cast of a head of a pharaoh, which had come from the collection of uh, Samuel Rogers. And to the right of the illustration, you can see a black marble Egyptian capital, uh, which he had acquired in 1818 from the collection of Robert Adam when he acquired uh, the bulk of Robert Adam's drawings and a number of books and uh, marbles. And so he he's really creating here a kind of nexus of pieces of uh, Egyptian art, uh, including the the a wooden sarcophagus which uh, was on the floor. But what's in what I find really striking is that he acquired with the sarcophagus about sixteen pieces of the lid which had been broken open in the uh, Middle Ages when the tomb was rifled, and he simply puts them underneath as if the tomb has just been broken open. Uh, it's a kind of poetic touch, which, needless to say, when the museum turned into a um, public museum had to be uh, tidied up. And then on the right, you'll see eventually he was constantly changing where works of art uh, were placed according to his fancy, right up to his death in January of 1837. And what's telling, I think, about the where the Egyptian capital ended up in the corridor outside the picture room is that it's stacked uh, between a rosette that is a copy of a rosette from a Roman triumphal arch, and above it is a plaster cast of the Corinthian capital of the Temple of the Sibyl at um, Tivoli, which had a very distinctive uh, sunflower in the uh, in, in its center. And it was a kind of motif that um, Soane used in his own architecture, particularly in the in the Bank of England. So he seems to be suggesting that the uh, Egyptian lotus motif and these uh, floral motifs in Roman architecture are somehow uh, kindred uh, spirits. And I mentioned earlier uh, cork models. He collected uh, a number of these um, and he was he began collecting them really at the time when their value was falling in terms of uh, the market. They, the origin of these was the Neapolitan uh, nativity scenes, the presepi, where the architecture, sometimes imposing architectural backdrops, were created out of cork, which had the ability to be, of course, easily carved, but also it could mimic uh, the effects of weathering, of brickwork, uh, so on and so forth. And sewn in the 1820s, put together um, what he called the model room, which was in a way a kind of conspectus of architecture, classical and uh, later <clears throat> architecture. Initially, it was on the uh, third floor of the number 13. Um, and then uh, he brought it downstairs to the second floor to what had been his wife's bedroom. Um, in the 18, mid-1830s. But what's noticeable here is you can see on the top level, you've got in the center the round temple of the Sibyl at Tivoli, flanked by two replicas of the Greek Doric temples at Paestum. And then down below on the main level uh, is a large model of Pompeii as it appeared in 1820, which he acquired from the estate of one of his early um, pupils. And then there was a cupboard, 
beneath that in which he kept drawings, which went back really to um, the 16th, 17th century England and contained drawings by Adam and um, Chambers, Chambers and other uh, architects. So it really was a kind of conspectus. And then below on the bottom was were models of so and so in architecture. So he insinuates himself into, as he often does in the building, into the uh, discussion. You can never be very far from a reminder of Soane. And on the wall are illustrations of architecture, which um, again was to give you a more rounded view um, of the models that you were looking at. And the idea for this was not uncommon. Um, other people had collections. John Nash, his rival, had a collection of uh, architectural models. But I think one of the ones that spoke to him particularly was the Architectural Museum of Louis-Francois Cassas in Paris. Sohn owned the catalog of this and was quite interested in it. And he would have seen it when he went to Paris in 1814. Uh, and again in 1819. But what was interesting about Cassas's um, collection was that it contained these uh, plaster cast reconstructions of ancient works and watercolors showing their actual state. Um, so this was the germ of the idea that uh, eventually filtered into Stone's treatment of such, uh, of, of, of this part of his, his collection. Now, we think of the Soane, certainly I did before I uh, became director, as largely devoted to archaeological specimens, to the classical world. But in fact, um, Soane was very heavily invested in what we would call, or what would have was then modern British art. And this was because he was an intensely political animal and having become a, an associate Royal Academician in 1795 and then a full Academician in 1802, he um, used his money, and I should say I haven't mentioned the fact, but he was not only a successful architect, but uh, he also married successfully. He married an heiress and he used her money uh, as well as the money that he gained from his salary at the Bank of England in private commissions to... Um, create a, a lifestyle and a collection which was um, would have been improbable uh, otherwise. And in 1819, he decided to create the first picture room. We're looking at uh, an engraving of it um, by Pugin, in fact, uh, which was published in a book by John Britton about collections in... Uh, London in 1820, which was published in 1825. Um, and what it stood on the site of what had been uh, Soane's architectural studio uh, behind number 12, Lincoln's Inn Field. Um, what you can probably make out are certain elements which are familiar from the museum itself. The chairs are the Chinese um, export uh, rosewood chairs, which are now in the drawing room. We don't know when he got them, but um, on the right is a window which has stained and colored glass, which eventually was moved down to the uh, basement and is uh, features in the monk's parlor. On the left, uh, one can make out the panels of the Rake's Progress, which Soane bought in 1802, when he had become a full academician. Um, again, part of this strategy to um, impress other people and probably himself with the fact that he had uh, arrived. Above them uh, is a long horizontal landscape, which he commissioned from Augustus Calcutt, a fellow uh, academician. And what um, I discovered that almost without exception, the paintings that uh, he acquired and also sculptures were by fellow academicians. So he would use his patronage as a kind of leverage within the academy itself. Um, the galleries that he was creating um, 
here um, were really created during the period, um, almost side by side with Dulwich College Picture Gallery, uh, so that he could benefit from ex experiments in both areas to uh, achieve a kind of series of top-lit uh, galleries. This one, as Britton notes uh, in the text, that even as he was writing it was being demolished because Soane was creating a new picture gallery, which is the one that we know today, which is on the opposite side of the back of the museum at the end of this sequence of galleries. Um, he built it in 1824, and I think it was uh, probably prompted by the fact that he just acquired some very large pictures. Um, he had, of course, the Canaletto, uh, the big Canaletto, which you see above the fireplace here, but also he had acquired, and you can just see on either side, uh, half of four of the great Hogarths of the Humours of an Election, which he acquired in 1823 from the estate of the widow of the painted, the um, actor David Garrick, uh, for um, over 1,700 pounds. It was the second most expensive thing in his collection after the Seti, uh, the sarcophagus of Seti the first. And um, he went it pulled out all the stops in creating uh, this room. Um, for instance, the floors are oak trimmed in mahogany. The dwarf cabinets are mahogany with uh, ebony inlay. You have uh, a very elaborate marble fireplace, which is has a mixture of Gothic and classical elements its own like to mix. And of course, the, um, the ceiling with these... Uh, vaults uh, was a mixture of classical and um, English Gothic. Um, what you can also see, and I put on the left a drawing by Sandby uh, of the east wall of the great room of the Royal Academy, as it was in Somerset House in those days, where uh, he is proposing a hang for the summer exhibition. And you can see that it is very dense and it goes right up to the sky. And um, it's the kind of thing that Soane would have seen and imbibed and replicates really in the picture room in the museum. And you can also see that, again, the Sandby here, of course, the, the prominent place above the fireplace is given to the president, Benjamin West. You have the usual suspects, Hopner, Opie, um, Beachy, um, Moreland, etc., cetera, um, in prominent positions, um, and then less prominent ones below the line. And of course, as, as I said, these exhibitions were tremendously important for, for selling, uh, not only for painting, but also for sculpture and uh, to a degree architecture, uh, architectural advertising. The Canaletto, the big Canaletto, uh, he acquired in 1807 from um, William Beckford. Beckford was selling the contents of uh, his father's house, Fontill Splendens, uh, in preparation to create uh, Fontill Abbey, his Gothic folly. He bought it for 150 guineas, which was less than he paid for paintings by Calcutt or uh, certainly Turner and uh, some of his, uh, and Henry Howard, other of his uh, contemporaries who were fellow academicians. It wasn't the first Candeletto he'd bought. He acquired two small ones, which are above it, uh, as you can see, from the um, Earl of Butte's collection, a uh, notable collection. Already in 1796, he had bought these before either, uh, it, when he was living in number 12. And again, it was part of this strategy to create um, a sense of wealth and uh, well-being. And you can see either side of the large Canaletto, a couple of the over 20 gouaches by Clarisseau, the French architect who taught architecture in uh, Rome at the uh, French Academy and also collaborated with Thomas Jefferson, among others, on architectural projects, um, which he began buying in the 1790s. The room 
is a small room. It's approximately 14 by 13 by 19 feet. Um, but with the use of the famous picture planes, um, Sohn was able to create the uh, effect of a much larger room, which would have been 25 by 40 feet, as he notes in his uh, private descriptions. Um, the picture planes were not an invention of Soane's. They had uh, been uh, in use for many years. George Dance, his, his early mentor, had created uh, in the Shakespeare Gallery in Pall Mall a series of these, and Samuel Rogers, among other private collectors, had uh, planes like this, uh, which were to enable you to view paintings in different lights and from different uh, angles. Um, what you see here, again, is a conjectural display, probably not ever uh, actually uh, created as such, but one of Gandhi's um, studies, which Sohn used to consider the impact, and you've got in the center one of the a suite of four Anglo-Indian or Indian uh, ivory chairs and an ivory table en suite. And on top of that, uh, you have uh, the model of the Temple of Vesta at uh, Tivoli, which probably never uh, stood there, but it was a kind of summa summarum of all of the things that uh, meant a great deal to Soane. And you get a good view here of the uh, ceiling, what he called arched canopies, which again is this fusion of classical and, and Gothic, which Soane relished uh, and was much criticized for in his own time because it seemed a flagrant um, disavowal of uh, classicism. And on the left, you see the nymph by um, Westmacott, which um, he makes a focal point of the picture room recess, which is uh, as you open the several panels, it suddenly comes into view in this extended space. It's a kind of coup de théâtre. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, Westmacott, it was a bit of um, transactional uh, dealing because Westmacott either gave him or sold him the chairs and the table. And in return, Soane um, gave Westmacott a great position in the um, in this uh, display. And of course, by the 1820s, people realized that Soane was creating a, a museum, even though it was at that point not uh, formally acknowledged. He, had, he only went to Parliament for a bill to preserve his house and collection in 1833. But already by this date, the death of his wife 10 years earlier in 1815, and his disappointment with his sons uh, affected, uh, determined him to uh, preserve the collection. There are some strange elements in the collection uh, which can only be explained again by personal associations. For instance, he obviously uh, revered Reynolds. Reynolds was the first president of the Royal Academy and Reynolds had presented the young John Soane with the gold medal for architecture in 1776. And at the presentation, he prophesied such great future for Soane that one of the people who was there said that it was worth more to Soane than the medal itself. Um, he couldn't find space. He couldn't accommodate one of Reynolds's great um, portraits, a full-length portrait. Uh, but this painting came from Reynolds's niece's collection. Um, and he acquired it from her estate in 1821. It's um, one of his fancy pictures, and it is uh, certainly of a, of a size that you could accommodate over a fireplace. And indeed, it had a specific focal point. It was a specific focal point in the picture room in the 1820s. And then latterly, Soane moved it to the library dining room where it sat behind his seat in uh, the library dining room facing uh, his portrait by the third president of the Royal Academy, Sir Thomas Lawrence. So sitting between the two of these, he could uh, commune with these figures in his uh, past and present. And likewise, uh, the painting, um, he has a number of paintings by Bourgeois who was uh, 
a mediocre painter at best. And this is one that's in the picture room recess in a rather prominent position. It's a painting of Kemble in a scene from Coriolanus. And again, Sohn was loved acting, loved the theater. He was, uh, he collected memorabilia of Garrick. He was a founder member of the Garrick Club. And Bourgeois was important to him because when Bourgeois died in 1811, he uh, left his collection of paintings to Dulwich, Pick, Dulwich College on the condition, uh, one of the stipulations was that uh, Soane be the architect of the galleries, and uh, which turned out to be uh, the case. Bourgeois was also part of a, a claque that supported Soane in his efforts to unseat George Dance as the professor of architecture. And then when Soane uh, was in dispute with the Royal Academy itself and was threatened with expulsion, rallied round and uh, supported him, uh, Bourgeois and uh, Beachy uh, in particular. Um, there are very few paintings by foreign artists in the collection, uh, which is unusual at the time when there were certainly collections of Dutch masters, um, French paintings and the like. One exception is this painting by Watteau, uh, the marriage contract or La Corde du Village, uh, which he acquired in 1802 um, from auction. I suspect that this may have been a painting that had been sold by Bourgeois um, to uh, accommodate himself, I suppose, in the years when he was stuck with this collection of paintings, which he and his colleague Noel Desenfant had put together for the um, King of Poland, and then after the partition of Poland, where it was on their hands. Uh, in any case, it's uh, an unusual uh, work for, for Sohn, and I suspect that uh, he bought it on the recommendation of Bourgeois. Uh, in, he bought it in 1802, and he paid 40 guineas for it, which was a considerable sum of money, but it was more than he paid for uh, 40 vases, uh, Greek vases that he acquired from the, state, the estate of James Clark the same year, 1802. Um, I think there was a great deal of acquisitions in that year because that was the year that he became a full RA. And again, this was a way in which he could um, set the seal on his arrival in the great world. Another um, aspect of the, the song which is quite uh, puzzling is the fact that there are two areas which are devoted to, uh, one is devoted to Shakespeare, it's called the Shakespeare Recess, and the other on the uh, floor above is the Tivoli Recess. They're really pockets off the staircase um, leading up through uh, the center of uh, number 13. And he could achieve these because the boundary line between number 12 and number 13 wasn't uh, a straight right angle, it was um, an obtuse angle because the boundary between 12 and 13 reflected uh, one of the medieval boundaries in the pieces of land that constituted Lincoln's in fields uh, in the Middle Ages. So Soane could take advantage of the fact that the plan of, of number 13 was shaped rather like a funnel to create these areas which were initially used for storage. You can see that uh, the behind the Shakespeare recess, it was a china cupboard, which he used as a china cupboard. Uh, the Tivoli recess was um, almost from the beginning given over to uh, celebration. Um, Soon was very much taken with the idea of, of uh, great British worthies. He'd worked at Stowe at the beginning of the uh, 1800s, um, designing the Gothic library and he would have known the temple of British worthies there and the idea obviously struck stuck with him because he um as I said created this um temple uh, this altarpiece almost to Shakespeare which included a uh, 
plaster cast of the bust in uh, the tomb in uh, Stratford, um, and uh, two paintings relating to Shakespeare. The drawing on the left shows an earlier creation, which uh, has a large painting by William Hamilton, another um, not particularly distinguished Royal Academician of the arrival of Richard II at Milford Haven, uh, and then above a scene of Lear and Cordelia on the uh, beach at the end of uh, King Lear. Um, it was uh, later replaced by uh, another painting, uh, which we see today, which was Shakespeare inspired by the muses. More interesting um, is the way in which this is linked with uh, the original display of the Tivoli uh, recess, called the Tivoli recess because the frieze on the wall, which we'll see better in a photograph in a, a few minutes, is taken from the Temple of Vesta at Tivoli. But originally in 1830, this was a shrine to Soane himself. You'll see on the lower left on a monopodium, um, Chantry's bust of Soane. Above the cupboard in the back is Soane's first teacher and mentor, George Dance, and then surrounding the bust of Soane are works that Soane uh, executed while he was at the Royal Academy, which won him the silver and the gold medal. It um, was um, in 1833, this was rethought, because in 1833, Soane secured the survival of the museum with the act of parliament that turned it into uh, uh, a museum but and so at that point the bust his bust of uh, of himself was moved down to the dome area uh, and the bust of dance was moved elsewhere and it was turned into um a display of british sculpture which i'll come on to in a moment but i just wanted to show you Briefly, this painting by Henry Howard, uh, one of two that Soane um, commissioned uh, from Howard. This was before the Shakespeare recess was created. And then after the Shakespeare recess was created, he created a, a, a painting of Shakespeare seated on a rock surrounded by the uh, muses. Um, the interesting thing about this is, I mean, who is Henry Howard? Henry Howard was the secretary of the Royal Academy. He occupied an important position, and also he was a go-between between Soane and the Academy in the years in which uh, Soane refused to give his uh, lectures on architecture and was almost um, excommunicated, as it were, by the Academy. And then in the 1830s, when Soane's eyesight was too poor, it was Howard who read his lectures on architecture and also how it facilitated the arrival of some of the pieces of sculpture in the collection. He's been called a uh, flaxman in color and that is perhaps uh, a good way to describe him and certainly Soane repeatedly employed his um, services, um, most notably in the paintings in the ceiling of the library dining room, the classically inspired uh, paintings. The Tivoli recess, as I said, once the museum was turned into a, um, a national museum, became a repository of what would be described as contemporary British sculpture. You can see on the left, uh, uh, Banks's, um, one of Banks's reliefs, no, two of Banks's reliefs, I'm sorry, and then in the recess at the end, um, below the frieze of the Temple of Vesta Tivoli, a uh, plaster cast of Flaxman's um, Shield of Achilles, um, Chantry's uh, Sleeping Child, and then Cupid and Psyche again by um, Flaxman. Um, I think when people realized that Soane was creating a museum that was not going to be dispersed, uh, they became interested in giving him works of art. And this was one of the few places uh, in the early 19th century where you could see um, examples of 
British sculpture. So um, John Flaxman's sister-in-law uh, gave him a large number of reliefs by Flaxman, which helps to explain the fact that there are so many there today. Um, these came from his studio and she was very resolute in trying to um, find a good home for all of these pieces. A number of them went to University College London. But you can see that uh, one thing, you the chapel-like uh, nature of this area, and because it was off the house, it could be top lit uh, on uh, this floor. So it, it, it gives it a wonderful atmosphere. And it would have been enhanced originally, or was enhanced by a copy of the stained glass by Reynolds of charity from the chapel of uh, New College, Oxford, which caused quite a stir when it was unveiled in the late 18th century. I've mentioned vases, and finally, I want to uh, touch on the display of vases, particularly in the dining room end of the library dining room. Um, if you've been to the museum, you will know that um, there's a suite of vases, Chinese, 18th century Chinese vases, Italian stone vases, and then in the center, a great volute crater um, from southern Italy, um, which belonged to the Baron Cador and uh, was acquired by Sohn from uh, the Cador sale of 1800 for 68 pounds. It was a considerable amount of money. Um, but these kind of vases were very fashionable in the day. You see them often in paintings that from the late 18th century onwards. Um, they largely came were, were found in southern Italy, so they were often called Etruscan, and Sohn continued to call them Etruscan right to the end of his life, even though there was ample evidence that uh, they were Greek in origin for the most part. Um, but what is interesting here is the, again, this idea that there is a kind of connection between these vases from Asia through um, the Mediterranean basin. And in addition to this, either side of this suite of vases, above the Chinese vases, Sohn placed these pieces of ash, which had been struck by lightning, and it formed a kind of sinuous design that I think he's suggesting is comparable or maybe an inspiration for the first ceramicists who created uh, pottery. So in other words, it's a reference to the idea that art imitates nature. And there are only two vases of any particular importance in the in the collection. Um, one was the Cardor vase, which we saw in the last slide. And here's the Englefield barrel amphora, which for which he paid um, over 20 pounds in uh, a, the sale of uh, the Englefield collection in 1823. And significantly, he put placed it under the canopy that divides the library from the dining room in uh, his house in Lincoln's Inn Field. And it's facing the model of the tomb that he created for his wife um, in 1816. And as I mentioned earlier, the death of Eliza Sohn was a, a great trauma for him. And um, he fetishized her memory throughout the house. There are various illustrations of the tomb throughout the ground floor, so he was never uh, out of eyesight of it. And putting the Englefield amphora opposite it, I think was can be explained because in the catalog by James Christie the Younger, who was something of an amateur uh, classicist and uh, archaeologist, Christie described the scene that we're looking at as a woman seated in a tomb and on the back, uh, which you can't see in this image, but is visible from a mirror that's own place behind it, there is 
uh, a young man running. And Christie imagined that it was something like a, a very variation on uh, Eridice and uh, Orpheus, that uh, the young man was running to liberate the woman from the tomb. So the juxtaposition of these two, I think, was had a resonance for Tone, which um, was that uh, you had a, a figure in a tomb and then uh, a, the tomb of his wife opposite it. And it's the kind of poignancy of, uh, of loss and longing that um, one feels throughout, uh, throughout the house. And in fact, there is a letter by James Christie the Younger to Soane in 1825. He, he kept in touch with Soane because Soane was a good customer, particularly for books, uh, but also for, he had purchased vases and other um, classical antiquities. And in this letter, he says that uh, there had been some, uh, a ship coming from the Mediterranean with vases. And he, he remarks quite tellingly that uh, they're not particularly um, significant, but they're quite showy. And he illustrates uh, two of them with these drawings, but um, Soane didn't really um, respond to this. So finally, by way of conclusion, I, I just, if you don't know the motivation for Soane's going to Parliament in 1833, it was largely down to his younger son, George, whom we see here in a bust by Thomas Banks, who was a friend of, of Soane's. It was made in 1804. And Soane kept it on display, as he did with uh, many images of his wife and children, um, even though his memories were um, tarnished by the fact that his elder son, John, um, who became an architect, never amounted to much and died early. Um, and George um, was the thorn in the flesh. He wanted to be a man of the theater, but uh, he wasn't um, ever able to support himself entirely. So he was constantly going back to his father for money. Uh, and there are a series of letters between the two, uh, George wheedling and sometimes threatening suicide, and things like that. Um, Soane discovered in 1832 that uh, George was living in a menage a trois with his wife and his sister-in-law and had had a child, child by the sister-in-law. And I think this was probably the final straw that led him to go to Parliament in 1833 and have a bill passed to allow the creation of the museum, which was the first time that a national museum had been uh, put, established in, in such a manner. The British Museum and the National Gallery had evolved uh, over the years. Um, and there was a debate about uh, whether uh, this was a sensible idea, uh, much along the lines of the debates over the British Museum in the 1750s. Who is the public? What is this intended for? And Soane um, stuck to his guns even though um, one MP uh, said that it was unnatural to cut off your children and also insinuated that the money that was being used as an endowment for this museum was in fact his wife's um, dowry and therefore by rights belonged to his surviving son. But so knew that if G George inherited, um, he would dissipate the fortune. So um, Soan prevailed, the museum opened and I began by quoting the negative opinions of three German um, scholars. And I just wanted to close by making, uh, quoting uh, Jacques Ignace Hittorf, who was a Franco-German architect of the 19th century who had visited the zone house and also uh, seen the Bank of England and wrote an appreciation of Soane, which appeared in a French publication in 1836. Um, and it was written in response to having seen a copy of the French edition of Soane's privately published description of his house and museum in 1835 that uh, Soane had sent to the Society of uh, Société des Beaux-Arts. Um, it 
The article contained a brief biography and appreciation of Soane's commissions, especially the Bank of England with its, as Hittoff said, calculated effects of light and perspective, and concluded, concluded with remarks on Soane's house for its ingenious sequence of spaces, magical treatment of light, colored glass and mirrors, as well as its enormous quantity of riches. Hittoff concluded by noting that the Soane Museum not only contains all that could serve for the education of an architect, but everything that could render it attractive. Such an ensemble would be very precious, but it has an inestimable value in England, where the elements necessary for the instruction of architecture are comparatively lacking in the only public institution, the Royal Academy. And this is an important point because uh, painting always took pride of place in the Academy since it offered more lucrative careers for budding architects than did sculpture or architecture. And Tone was aware of this uh, defect and therefore his threats at times to form his own um, academy were taken seriously by the uh, academicians and uh, it never happened. But down to the late 19th century, the Soane Museum was the only place where uh, an architect, a budding architect, could find material that would enrich his uh, knowledge of the architectural tradition. So by conclusion, I would say that if you want to learn more, buy this book. Thank you very much. <laughs>